My name is Don Guy, and I have the uh, privilege of uh, introducing uh, this uh, great debate, this hotly anticipated great debate that is obviously drawing all of you in this room. By the way, I just made a critical mistake in political dialogue, at least according to Frank Lunds, uh, the legendary Canadian Republican pollster, one word progressives should never use is privilege to describe themselves. You should never say, I am privileged to do this. Nonetheless, I feel like that's the case, so I am privileged to do it. And it is a, it's a treat, that would be a better word, a treat to be here. Um, it's also particularly a treat to be uh, back in uh, Ottawa. I will say I got on the plane in Vancouver on Thursday evening, it was 16 degrees, to come to the land where if you wear a parka and your long johns and stand in the sun, you can stand the spring. <laughs> By the way, is uh, Steve Pakin still here with his uh, timer? Okay, good. I have a few things I want to get off my uh, shoulders here. Uh, one of them is uh, that, as uh, some of you may know, uh, about eight months ago, uh, I entered into uh, a uh, partnership with uh, Greenberg Quinlan Rosner Research, uh, and my colleague Anna Greenberg was uh, up uh, yesterday and participated in one of the panels, and it was real. Uh, that was a great event as well, and she was very pleased to be able to uh, be up. And we were particularly pleased uh, when we set up shop. One of the first pieces of work that Anna and I did up here was with the Broadbent Institute on Income Inequality. And it was uh, a really great working with the team, with Rick and the team, uh, and it was an important piece of work to do. So uh, thank you to, uh, to Rick and the Broadbent Institute for the opportunity to do that. <laughs> Speaking of income inequality, how about that Ontario sunshine list? Okay, that didn't get the laugh I thought it was going to get. <laughs> but in this room, it's not necessarily a surprise. Um, speaking of, uh, of uh, great debate, and the particular the topic that we're going to be uh, hearing about this afternoon, uh, austerity versus spending, investment versus cuts, I'm really looking forward to it because we have four uh, terrific panelists who are going to say things in this room today that are really important things to say that represent the point of view that they advocate. I'd say virtually none of the things that these panelists are going to say today will ever be heard from any of the political parties in the coming federal election, which is an even more important reason why we want to have this debate here today. And it's another reason to be, uh, uh, to commend the Broadbent Institute for putting it on. Our moderator today uh, is a man who needs no introduction, Tom Clark, uh, one of the uh, most respected journalists in Canada. I had my oppo team go to work on Tom Clark for this introduction. We googled his name, found his Wikipedia page, and oh my goodness, it's already there. Apparently there is some mystery about exactly when Tom Clark was born. <laughs> And I'll, I'll uh, leave it to him to clarify that, but he is uh, uh, a uh, long-standing and respected journalist in Canada and uh, is the chief political correspondent for Global News as well as host of the West Block, and I always enjoy uh, watching him in that show. And with no further introduction, I give you Tom Clark. I'm going to go over there. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you, Don, uh, for that introduction. Thank you all for showing up. And to clear up the question that Don brought up about when was I born, you know, it was funny because I, I had that same conversation with Mackenzie King. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. He was asking me what Laurier was really like. And, uh, <laughs> Anyway, thank you, Don. 
Uh, so budgets, that's what we're here to talk about. Now some of you may be unfamiliar with the term budget. We haven't had one in Ottawa for a while. <laughs> we, we may not have one for a long while yet. So just try and keep it uncomplicated because people I think may be okay. out, of, out of step with understanding what, what a budget is, understandably. But let me just lay the table first of all, then I want to uh, introduce the, the debating teams here. Arguably, the one thing that government does that is more important than almost anything else that it does is the budgetary process, the raising of money and the spending of money. And in that process, what they decide are not only what the incentives are going to be, but the disincentives. And it, through that process, you see the country that you get because it creates the country that you get and it also creates the government that you either enjoy or endure uh, depending on how the process goes. So, the big question on the table right now is budgets. Do we invest? Do we cut? Do we balance or do we grow? Okay. And at what cost on either side of that equation? So, allow me first of all to introduce to you the debaters tonight. Uh, first of all, it's really easy to figure out who's on which team, okay? <laughs> Seriously, there was, I'm telling you, there was no memo sent out. But the guys in the suits and ties, <laughs> kind of on the right-hand side of the spectrum. <laughs> so they would be, let me introduce, first of all, Monty Solberg, you know him well. He was a former cabinet minister, former member of parliament, uh, now works uh, with New West Communications out in Calgary. Uh, and uh, Monty also writes for the uh, Toronto Sun. Is that still publishing? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to get some water. Monty was the, also the one yes, who on Alberta election night at 8.01 in Alberta called a majority government for Danielle Smith. This guy <laughs> really knows what he's talking about. Thank you. Also part of Team Conservative, Team Right, whatever you want to call it, is Philip Cross. He is a senior fellow with the McDonald Laurier Institute, has spent decades, 36 years at uh, Statistics Canada. He is a well-known, extremely well-respected commentator on all things to do with statistics and the economy. You can hear him on numerous uh, media outlets. Uh, and Philip is also a very prolific writer of his views and as I said, one of the most respected people in Canada in that area. Ar Armin Yout, yeah. Now moving to the no-tie party here. Uh, Armin Yalnizian, she is a senior economist with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, but she also, like Philip, is very prolific in uh, helping uh, to uh, do public education and public commentary on all things that we're going to be talking about. You can hear her on Metro Morning on CBC Radio if you're in the Toronto area. Uh, twice a week, she's on the Amanda Lang show. I think it's called The Exchange. Uh, it is called The Exchange. I know that. I, I was, that was I, I'm sorry. That was, that was really cheap of me. Okay. And and much to her amazement, uh, she is on the Canadian Association of Business Economics, uh, but also to the delight of everybody else who's with that association. Uh, Armin, there we go. And I'm tempted to say Linda McQuaig needs no introduction. So, moving on. Uh, <laughs> Linda McQuaig, of course, a journalist, a prolific author. Her last book, uh, The Trouble with Billionaires, just one of many, many books that she's written. And she is also the NDP candidate in Toronto Centre in the coming election campaign. <laughs> You notice I didn't say the October 19th election campaign, because <laughs> we're not really sure at this point. Anyway, 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is your debating team, and we have already chosen the order of speaking. And what's going to happen here is that everybody's going to have a short introductory statement, four minutes. And I would just say to all of the, uh, the panelists and teams here, you can track your four minutes by looking at that screen right there. And that'll tell you. So if you go over four minutes, and I start going like that, everybody will know, everybody here is on my side, okay? <laughs> And, Marty, if you go over, I'll just come over and slug you. Okay. okay? That's, <laughs> uh... Anyway, so the order of speaking has been uh, fixed. We're going to have some opening statements, and then we're going to get into a free-flowing conversation that uh, I think is going to be a lot of fun and uh, hopefully very passionate as well, because these are extremely important big issues. So, Armin, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Tom, and thank you for being here today. You know, when we talked about how we were going to do this ahead of time, these two gentlemen uh, very graciously said they knew they were in defeat before they walked into this room and in fact when we are going to talk about this today this is like kind of shooting fish in a barrel in this in this room but in fact what these gentlemen are going to say is the establishment orthodoxy and my job here is to talk to you about how we challenge the orthodoxy of 20 years as Gabriel Nadeau Dubois said this this afternoon or this morning rather 20 years of austerity we've been dealing with the budgets in Alberta Quebec and what we might be getting whenever we get that federal budget is just the most recent version of uh, an ongoing discourse about why deficits are too big, why debts are too big, why governments are too big. And they're based on two false assumptions. Number one, if you cut the deficit and you cut the debt, you, happy taxpayers, will save money. And number two, less government means more economic growth. Now, less government means more economic growth relies like religion on the idea that only the private sector can grow the economy and the less interference of the government, the better for automatic growth. Of course, that really didn't work out that well in 2008. So if you got uh, this idea that we are starting from this point, I want to help you understand how do we get that conversation to start to change. Number one, what you must know is that what we don't have in Canada is a deficit problem. What we have is a growth problem. And it is not unique to Canada. All around the world, we are looking at secular stagnation. Growth rates just keep getting downgraded over and over again, whether you're China or Canada. So what we are dealing with with secular stagnation is when that gets, when, when, when we're finished with that, when that means that, you know, two or three percent growth rates are no longer what's uh, predicted in the cards or even lower, we're heading straight into population aging. Both of these things will slow the economy for as far as the eye can see. So in that context, with low interest rates thrown into the mix, you cannot afford to ignore the massive infrastructure under investment uh, overhang that we've got. This is the time to invest, not in five years, not in 10 years when the cost of borrowing money is higher and the cost of wages is higher. And if you don't think fixing the infrastructure is the right idea now, in the next few years, then try not fixing it and see how you can become a pole for growth. Now, the other side will tell you exactly the opposite message, that it is a good time to pay less now. They say, look down. Don't look up and don't look out. They say zero is the bottom line and that is the right number for all of us. They say, there, I fixed it with zero while we watch them break it. Here's the issue. The federal government as a sharer of economy is at the rate, uh, get, gathers revenues at the rate of 1958. The finance minister is happy to tell you that. The prime minister is happy to tell you that. What they don't tell you is we're spending at rates at levels the same as the 1950s. We have, since the 1990s, given the provinces more of the responsibility to do the heavy lifting, and they're the ones much more indebted than the federal government. But if the government sector as a whole shrinks, if austerity is the solution to growth, whereas trade is not picking up because of lower uh, oil prices and households are at record levels indebtedness, that leaves you with one sector to do the heavy lifting, the business sector. And what have we been hearing about the business sector in the last few years? It's called dead money. 
We've got $680 billion in surplus on non-financial corporate balance sheets. And when those folks spend, they spend on mergers and acquisitions, both of which uh, this whole com combination means we are providing less growth in terms of being, doing things more efficiently, productivity enhancements, or even expanding the production frontier. So I've got one minute remaining, so don't you do this. No, 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 you, no you don't. Yeah. I well, don't? As an economist, you just failed. Yeah, no, that one minute was two minutes ago. Well, how, how do I know that? Yeah. That's what that says. That, this is deficit timing that we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so. So can I do one last hit? No. Can they just no. Oh, oh, sweetheart. I know, it's I know, such a bad relationship that we're starting. I know, I know. We'll fix it later. So I think the Fed should yeah. be made. <laughs> yeah, me too. Now, okay, now you've said a lot of what we're going to hear from Monty and Philip, so this might be a good idea to throw it to Philip to say, are you going to say what she just said you were going to say? Uh, no, I th uh, certainly not uh, in as entertaining a form. <laughs> First, I'd like to thank the Broadband Institute for inviting me here. Uh, being surrounded by hundreds of liberals and progressives, it reminds me a lot of my time in government. So. <laughs> uh, I'd like to start by saying, I've, the question's a bit loaded. Uh, the question is, invest or cut? And of course, you know, it's framed as investment. I think everybody agrees is the most beneficial type of government spending. And cutting, of course, conjures up images of Greek-style slash and burn austerity. But that's not really the two alternatives we have in front of us. The alternatives are more government spending in all its various forms, most of which don't leave a tangible asset or restrain government spending since, uh, frankly, cutting government spending outright is, over long periods of time has simply proved impossible. So the choices aren't as, as stark as laid out. One question I have for my fellow debaters is, do you believe that there's a level of debt at which uh, the, uh, the economy starts performing not as well? Um, or can you increase indebtedness forever with no consequences? Uh, I think when we look at Europe and Japan today, we see societies that have, it's usually around 100% of debt to GDP, but when you get to these levels like Europe and Japan, the economies just don't perform as well. Canada had its own fiscal crisis in the mid-1990s when our uh, debt to GDP ratio hit 92%. So uh, you, you talked about that we represent the right. I'd like to think we represent realism. Um, Meanwhile, we, uh, the best performing, um, so we see Europe and Japan where they continue to have run high deficits and it just doesn't get any better. Meanwhile, the best performing economies in the G7 today are the US and the UK. What policies are they pursuing in terms of fiscal policy? Uh, austerity. Uh, Britain's brought down its uh, deficit by 6% over the last couple of years. The US. Uh, thanks to its sequestration, had a sharp reduction in its deficit, and lo and behold, their economies are performing better than uh, nations that are resorting to deficit spending. Um, I'm not saying that uh, we should never run deficits. We saw in the 2008, 2009, sometimes deficits are necessary. Um, macroeconomic policy involves a trade-off. In the short term, sometimes if the economy's in recession, to stabilize the economy in the short term, you need deficits. But at some point, those deficits dampen long-term growth. And if you continue to run deficits year after year, at some point, we start seeing long-term consequences for long-term growth. Um, but also, uh, the, the other problem with uh, chronic deficits is it reflects a society that can't make choices. We've seen that in Italy and France, closer to home, Quebec and Ontario. You just end up trying to, uh, to uh, satisfy everyone. You end up just transferring uh, money from the right-hand pocket to the left hand. Uh, I'd also like to, uh, to talk about the future, that there's a looming challenge of the aging population. Uh, so we do need to invest more. However, this investment needs to be in the form of more thought, not dollars, about how we're going to de deliver health care and pensions in the future. Today, the 10% uh, of our population is over 65. Soon, that's going to be 25%. How are we going to afford all the expenses related to that uh, with our current healthcare system? So uh, my argument is going to be partly based on that we have to be looking ahead. We need to be saving now because the demands on government in the future are going to be extremely large. And the reality is you're out of time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Linda McQuaig. <laughs> Thank you.
Linda McQuaig, your four minutes. Uh, okay, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Philip Cross. Uh, it's certainly intimidating speaking right after such an esteemed economist as Philip Cross. Uh, I've followed you for years, and I recall an article you wrote in the Financial Post a few years ago in which you described the economic thinking on the left as crackpot. <laughs> so I just want to begin by saying how deeply honored and thrilled I am to be here today in a room full of crackpot. <laughs> Our opponents make much of this sort of underdog thing that they're outnumbered and everybody loves to be an underdog, <laughs> I get it. You know, but enjoy your underdog status while it lasts because very soon we're going to return to the real world where you guys are in fact backed by the most powerful business and financial and political interests and we're just part of a room full of suspects under surveillance from <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> uh, of course, the topic today is a great one, public investment versus austerity. Kind of sums up the battle between conservatives and progressives. You know, conservatives, low taxes, low spending, rely, rely on the marketplace. Progressives want higher taxes, higher spending, you know, strong role for government. But sadly, in the last 20, 30 years, we've increasingly seen the dominance of the conservative agenda. And one very clear result of that has been a dramatic increase in inequality. Now, we were always told, though, that there would be a trade-off. Yes, there'd be some more inequality, but the trade-off would be higher growth. Well, now, now we discovered that that's a sham. In fact, very recently, the OECD, the IMF, the World Bank have all come out with major <coughs> studies showing that, in fact, high inequality caused by this conservative uh, austerity agenda actually leads to reduced growth. In fact, you can get some numbers on it from the IMF and the OECD. Canada, because of our higher inequality, has reduced economic growth of about $6 billion a year. So not only do, is there no trickle down, but there's no trade-off. The conservative austerity agenda gives us greater inequality and greater lack of growth. <laughs> now, let me, let me just quickly point to the example of Alberta. Alberta, of course, blessed with oil, cursed, unfortunately, with neoconservative thinking. <laughs> so as a result with a, their obsession with low taxes, they've kind of lived off their oil revenues, their hostility to government and planning and investment has made them kind of hand over the management of their precious oil to the private sector. And so now when oil prices have plunged, they're in crisis. They, in fact, only have $17 billion saved up, and that could be depleted very quickly. I want to compare that to Norway. Norway, which is similarly blessed with oil, but it's also blessed with progressive economic thinking. They've got high taxes, high spending, high investment, big government, big unions, the whole crackpot agenda. <laughs> I just got to finish. Yeah. Uh, we're going to finish in a minute. No, no, I, I, I had to oh, take okay. the same actions against Armin. So, you know, But can I, I'm just in the middle of my point about... I know, but just try and get in the game a little bit more than you are. <laughs> kind of okay, let me just conclude. Anyway, we'll give you a chance. We don't know. We'll give you a chance. But we've got to get on with this. What? <laughs> Wait. Are you, telling me, are you telling me you don't want to hear from Audie Solberg? <laughs> I don't think so. No, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll give Monty an extra 30 seconds if you let me just complete this. Oh, yeah. I yeah, I, no. <laughs> then I'd be unfair to our meeting. She can have an extra 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> More time yeah. for everybody. 
<laughs> no, I, I, no. I, I, seriously, we're going to move on. We are seriously going to move on. Okay? Keep that your closing statement. Hey, the guy in the black and white striped shirt never gets the applause of the crowd in the stadium. So, you know, <laughs> there you go. I, I'm going to throw it to Monty Solberg, who wanted to be introduced as the soon-to-be-late Monty Solberg. Monty. <laughs> well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Brother Tom. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to be here. I just want to say that uh, Linda has suggested that I'm in the, in the real world, and uh, I just look forward to you joining us someday, Linda. <laughs> Great to have you. Um, in answer to the question we, that we've been asked to address, I want to say it's always time to invest in programming that produces results. And it's always time to cut spending that doesn't produce results. Uh, to me, this isn't about an ideology, it's about a return on investment. I think that's uh, pretty obvious. I think it's also obvious that Canada and the UK, in spite of or even because of their restraint programs, have led the G7 in economic growth and job creation over the last number of years. But let's set that aside just for a moment. Honestly, I think the better discussion to have today is, given what we know about the country's indebtedness, the cost of living for the average family, and government's ability to deliver effective programs and services, how should we divide the surpluses? Notice that I'm taking off the table the option of just going deeper into debt. Like it or not, and I do like it, and our mind actually mentioned this, there is now an orthodoxy in Canada, which is that governments should try to balance their budgets over a business cycle. Yes, of course, some governments uh, run deficits and win re-election, but none of them claims that deficits are good and that we can just go on spending ever more without serious consequences. After the problems with countries like Greece and other European debt paradises, the days of deficit and debt denial are over. No, a political platform that argues that more debt is a good thing is just a political non-starter. So instead, let's deal with reality. And Linda talked about this, such as the present day situation in Canada. Over the last several years, the federal government has restrained spending, mostly by holding the line on operational spending, meaning Canada is once again on the cusp of that virtuous cycle where a balanced budget combined with revenues increasing at the rate of nominal GDP soon starts to pile up in the form of large surpluses. In a situation like that, it's possible to reduce debt, lower taxes, and strategically invest all at the same time. And let's remember that all have their benefits. But why assume that more spending is better than paying down debt or lowering the family tax bill? So after, uh, so I would argue that real increases in spending should only occur when they lead to proven tangible improvements in outcomes that exceed the benefits that would be derived by paying down debt or lowering taxes. So after years of restraint, it makes sense to increase spending to match inflation and population growth uh, on at least most of the spending. It's not automatically necessary to do that on the operational side, um, uh, it, on the operational side just because the population has grown. But should we increase, uh, increase spending in other areas? Well, maybe we should. But first I want to see the evidence that it will help. Not all government spending is equal in importance and not all of it is effective. I would argue that it's quite unjust and even socially unjust uh, to spend more when, for instance, could use that money more effectively. Uh, more effectively. Remember, it's always about return on, on investment. Where do you get the best return on investment? Not only that, lower taxes encourage capital formation, making it possible to expand existing businesses and to start new ones. In turn, the tax base expands, meaning more government revenue, even though tax rates have gone down. That's not just a theory, by the way. That's what's happened in the last 20 years when both liberal and conservative governments have cut taxes. In closing, let's expand the definition of investment to include lowering taxes and paying down debt, both of which may provide a better return on investment than spending more on government services. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Nicely done. All right, come on. All right, so the phase we're gonna go into now, this is gonna be a free-flowing discussion I, we've all agreed we're going to try not to talk over each other because we want you to be able to understand. Uh, and uh, 
and you don't have to wait to be invited in. You can, but if, if I jump in, it's just because I want to give everybody a fair shot at uh, increasing the discussion. Can I just start off here, and please take it any way you want, but the one thing that I was sort of picking up from everybody on the stage was where we are now after nine years of conservative legacy on the, on the budgetary road that we've been on. And it seems to me, and maybe this is, uh, the, I ask this as a question rather than a statement, has this become more a question of ideology than a question of numbers? In other words, the Conservatives set out to create smaller government and to remove most of the levers that would provide a future government to increase the size of government again. Are we inevitably now in a long period of smaller, less effective government? And uh, Armin, why don't you start? Yeah, I don't think that that's the case at all because I think what we're seeing with the population aging that Philip actually brought our attention to that I mentioned is the way we're going to move forward isn't through the rapid growth that Monty thought is automatic when you cut uh, debt. We are moving into a period of slowing growth. Virtually all the advanced industrialized nations have got population aging. We're not going to get the same purchasing power kick when things start picking up, whatever that is. Whenever it is, businesses get off their hands and start investing. That's why businesses aren't investing. So consequently, I think it is possible for us in this room to change the narrative about how do you make life better for Canadians. And one of those ways is take a look at the health care spending. You said yourself, Philip, we need to spend smarter, not necessarily more. If we spent more of our health care budget, our public health care budget, on public health interventions, making people healthier than, than requiring people to have more health care, that would be one of the smartest things we could do. You want to jump in, Philip? Uh, one big difference in Canada is our deficit problem is very much at the provincial level. That at the federal level, yeah, things are relatively under control. The real problem is at the provinces, uh, Ontario and Quebec in particular. That's not by accident. Huh? That's not by accident. Okay. That was by design. And that's all that the federal government is sticking with. Maybe it's by design, but they're, they're the people that are going to have to deal with it. And particular health care going forward, you know, that's a provincial responsibility. No, no, but, but uh, just a second. The Wrong. point is that... Oh, Easy. Oh. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. That, that the, Out of the gate. I knocked you off the chair with my remarks. <laughs> you did. They were so crazy. <laughs> no, uh, the, the truth is, what's, you're absolutely right. They, we've downloaded the deficit problems to the provinces. Oh, no. And, and now what the Harper government has put in place, which is going to kick in in 2017, is a, a cut to, to health care spending, to health care transfers to the provinces, to the tune of $36 billion over 10 years. When that, when that, and they did it very stealthily. They just quietly, uh, you know, they didn't announce that they were undermining Medicare like that. They just... They just, Harper just announced in 2011 when the health accord expired with the provinces, he just announced he wasn't going to negotiate anymore. He was going to impose his own unilateral funding for it. Well, equalization is a, uh, equalization and these oh, transfers are, well, let, let's talk, well, first of all, on health care transfers, they're going up at 4.5% a year for the next number of years. That's hardly a cut. No, 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 no. it is a cut, Monty, because in 20, in, uh, under the previous Liberal government, they put in plan a place to restore health care funding after the deep cuts that Paul Martin made to it in the late 90s uh, in, in, in order to get the deficit. The big promise at that time was once we get the deficit in place, uh, under control, we'll restore some of the funding to programs. He didn't really do that. He more went to the tax cuts, but he did restore some funding to health care, and that was what the well, health accord was And a four and a half percent increase uh, is a restoration of funding for health care. And secondly, he gave the provinces all kinds of latitude to go and try some things to make well, the program more effective. Well, you're talking about two-tier health care. Money without a plan is just that, money. If you want a six... Well, they, the have, provinces have, run health care. They have, have the plan. You could have a 6% solution to transform health care with actually having it dedicated, mission-oriented financing, which is something the Broadband Institute has been talking about. How do you take our federal money that we're sending to the provinces and say, take this extra money every year and transform it just like we did on wait times? Why can't we do that to actually I'd, spend it on public health? I'd like to see that happier? with Quebec. 
try that with Quebec and see how far that goes. All the, all the, all the provinces at the table once a year could come together to have an all of Canada solution. If you had a federal government that was dedicated to saying this is how we bend the cost curve and improve health, you can bend that freaking cost curve, but people can get sicker quicker. Well, the very first thing you do is, if you're the federal government, is you actually agree to sit down with the provinces right. and talk to them. Oh. rewriting the health care right on you say you say that oh well we're giving the provinces lots of opportunity to introduce new things what you mean is we're giving the provinces no choice but to rely on some private services because they won't have enough money to cover the public services well we that them, is two-tier medicine we we give them the choice to go ahead and run the health care systems like they're like they're given the uh, the authority to do under the Constitution with, according, the money according to, to what the people in their provinces when, want. When Medicare was set up in the 60s, the federal government funded 50 percent, okay, and the province did the rest. Now it's down, the federal funding's down to 20 percent. And with this Harper cut, this 36 billion, it'll be down to 12 it's an increase. Let me let me let me jump in because I, there's a lot more to cover in the budget than 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 healthcare spending, as important as it is. But I, I was really interested picking up on this notion of federal responsibilities in terms of paying for services and provincial responsibilities and how that gets downloaded. Monty, you come from Alberta, or as I call it, our version of Greece. <laughs> uh, oh. Oh. He's right. Over the past 40 years, it's become the ultimate dine and dash welfare state in this country. Oh. Uh, spending more per capita than any other province on services and raising less per capita than any other province. Because of their lower taxes. Well, hang on. I want to ask, though, is that the model that you think the rest of the country should pursue? Well. <laughs> Which side are you on? <laughs> In 2014, Alberta produced uh, more jobs than all the other provinces combined. That's a model to pursue. You know, I would, I would argue, uh, uh, Tom, that there's no question that uh, conservative governments have done a terrible job over the last uh, 10 years of uh, being responsible with the oil wealth that the, uh, that the oil sands in particular generated. No question about it. What they should have done is brought their spending into line with the other provinces on a Wait. per capita basis and uh, at least produced results in terms of services that were equal because they have it. Right now they spend $2,000 more per person, for instance, on, on health care than the other provinces, and the other provinces get better outcomes. That's not a great record. It doesn't speak well for, uh, uh, for how the government has managed that, that money. There's no question that money should have gone into the Heritage Savings Trust Fund and uh, become more of an asset that would produce uh, income down the road for Albertans after the oil was gone. But that speaks, in my mind, in favor of austerity, not spending ever more money. I want to get Philip in here. What concerns me about the current situation is it looks a lot like the 1970s. Uh, we, we appear to have the deficits under control, but underneath there was a very large structural deficit accumulating. It was hidden by low interest rates, but once the economy uh, hit a recession in 1982 and interest rates went up, then the deficit was suddenly revealed. And I'm worried now that we're in an environment of low interest rates. We should be taking advantage of this to get our fiscal house in order before the aging problems really start pushing up government spending. Uh, this isn't the time to uh, increase spending now. So I just want to go back to what Monty actually said. One of the reasons why Alberta is spending more per capita than other jurisdictions is it's growing faster than any place else in Canada, and that takes an infrastructure build. To say that, to, you know, if I think it was Calgary that said they've added sub, sub, suburbs that are the same size as Regina, the whole city, in the space of three years. And it took Regina all, you know, decades to get that big. It costs money to service growth. So you can't just say don't spend, the solution is to cut. And in fact, what we're learning from Alberta is a lesson that we need to learn at the federal level, which is the solution is to diversify your economy. We have got an economic action plan. We have got 
got an economic action plan that is predicated on 20th century technology and oil. End of story. That is our only economic action plan. And when oil fails, we don't have another economic development plan. And what we should be doing is thinking about ways that Canada can be the poster child for not energy east, but energy least. How can a cold... <laughs> a cold country with massive expanses show the rest of the world how to be the most energy efficient, the, the most renewable energy sourced economy in the world. This is something we can export. This is what the rest of the world needs. And we've got the technology to start doing it in our own backyard, but that is not the focus. Let's move into the 21st century. Let's not look at a zero bottom line. Let's look at the future and how Canada can grow. Well, I just... <laughs> I have to respond to our mind on that. Um, you know, in the 1980s, Alberta. Armin is the name. Armin. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, back in the 1980s in Alberta. In Alberta <laughs> yeah. Back in the uh, back in the 1980s in Alberta, we uh, tried to go and diversify into all these various areas. All of those businesses ended up, uh, you know, the government invested in them. They all went, uh, ended up going bankrupt. Same in uh, new, in uh, pardon me in uh, Cape Breton. You could go to Cape Breton today. It's like a museum of government attempts to go ahead and uh, and try and diversify the economy, coal mines, and steel mills, and all kinds of things. It's not that easy to do. Take the $13 billion we give to the oil and gas industry and spend it on R&D and renewables. Oh, wow. Wow. And, and, and how is that plan about focusing exclusively on oil looking in Alberta now? Not so good, right? Well, it's not a question of the government focusing well, on oil. It's, certainly it's the investment of... goes there because it makes sense to take a resource that's sitting in the ground and utilize it. And Subsidizing Why are we subsidizing? The subsidies that we have for it and the royalty system and everything favors it incredibly over other aspects of the economy. That's why it's so, I mean, if we gave the same kind of subsidies to, to green energy, I mean, imagine what we could do. I've got a question for Philip, uh, again, just stemming out of this. How important are balanced budgets? And that's not just a, an economic question, it's a political question. We know that balanced budgets are going to probably come out sometime, whenever the budget comes out this year. Uh, but that's a political imperative. How important is a balanced budget? It doesn't have to be important in any particular period of time. Um, to prepare for this debate, I read a book called Is the Debt War Over? Uh, it, it was in 2002. Uh, they, the IRPP collected all the major economists in, in Canada. Their consensus was that because of this looming disaster of aging coming, that's just going to add 50 percentage points to our debt to GDP, we should actually be running surpluses now. We should be paying down our, our debt now so to prepare ourselves for what's coming. So uh, there are instances when you want to be running surpluses. And the interesting thing is, Monty, I remember you in the 2004 campaign. And you were on the trail trying to show how Paul Martin and the Liberals did a terrible thing by underestimating what they needed and raising more than, uh, and, and you said, this is just putting money on the table that doesn't have to be there, kind of like the surpluses that Philip's just talking about. Do you believe that it's time to get surpluses? Because your government is going for balance. They're saying we don't need surpluses. Well, I'm not sure they're saying we don't need surpluses. Well, they did. I mean, what they're trying to do. <laughs> They're not, they're not suggesting, Tom, that the money should pile up and go into a special fund. I agree with that. That money will get utilized for different things. It'll be either strategic investment, paying down debt, or lowering taxes. It'll be one of those, those three things. So yes, there will be a surplus for a moment, then it'll be reallocated that particular way. I think that's wise. I think it makes a lot of sense to do that because at any one time, an economy has different challenges or society has different challenges and it's up to government to figure out how that money is best utilized. What's the best return on investment? And a lot of times I would argue, Tom, that it boils down to helping families because families are in a much better place to figure out 
how to use that money than some bureaucrat 2,000 miles away in Ottawa. Yeah, but you give, if you give like through this uh, $100 thing that the Conservatives give, uh, if you give like $100 per family per child, what can they do with that? Buy some ice cream, you know, buy some pizza. Whereas if you create a national public that. health care, no, it's not that. enough. It's not going to do anything. If you create a national child care system, you can save, you can save those families $20,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm really interested in the thematic here. There's two thematics that come from the right. One is give it back to families because we don't know how to use it. So let's get them out of government because they don't know how to use the taxes that we've got. Oh. And the second theme is fear. Be afraid of interest rates rising. Be afraid of an aging population. Don't do anything to actually make it better when these things happen. Don't actually invest in infrastructure now when interest rates are at historic lows, when there are still people unemployed. No, don't do that. Wait till it's more expensive. Expensive, and then be even more afraid or in fact don't get ready for an aging population by actually having high quality regulated early childhood education so we have every hand on deck when we need it no bring in temporary foreign workers which drive down wages and actually make it harder to have well. revenues to cover the services we need you want, the choice has never been clearer. Can I also address Philip's point about this aging population, how we're, it's going to cripple us financially? I mean, the simple truth is, I don't know if you remember, like 20, 30, 40 years ago, the big question was, in the future, yeah. what are we all going to do with our leisure time? <laughs> remember that? Now that sounds ridiculous now, but in fact it wasn't ridic ridiculous because it was based on the analysis that if the economy kept growing at the same rate it was growing and income was divided in the same way that it was currently being divided at that point, there would be lots of surplus. You know, the society would just get richer and richer. And in fact, you know, we'd all be left in our old age just with so many different things we wanted to do, not in having to work till we're 90. So, but, but what ended up happening, the economy grew just as expected, but instead of the income distribution staying the same, all the economic gains in the past 30 years, virtually all of them have gone to the top 10% of Canadians. That's where our retirement incomes have gone okay. to those at the top. Uh, that's, that's absolutely not true. I mean, that's, that might be true for the U.S. I'm not going to go there. No, no, it's true. We just, I just put out a paper with Minir Sheik on the middle class. Uh, the middle class uh, incomes have grown over the last, whatever, 10, 20, 30 years you want to measure it. We're not the United States. Some aspects Let's get the, of the middle class have grown, but you cannot Can deny that the bulk of the money has gone to that top 1%, uh, well, the top 10%, the top 1%. Every, all the authorities say that. So, uh, April 22nd, 2014 edition of the New York Times points out that Canada has now outstripped the U.S. as of 2010 in terms of the wealth of our middle class. Not only have, they, have we outstripped and continue to outstrip uh, the U.S., but we now outstrip Norway, the Dutch, all kinds of European nations. Well, why I, I is that? I actually think that the Scandinavian countries and... and uh, Switzerland and places like that were left out of that particular study you're talking Norway, about. Norway, Norway. No, I don't think well, so. it's it's in I there. Mean, it's in there. I so mean. let me just address the fact that Canada has Canada's middle income earners, households, have seen income growth. Yes, Philip, because we now have two workers instead of one. And we have Oh, we had forever. I'm just gonna finish. We have two workers instead of one, and we have invested as a society to double our university attainment level. We have invested heavily in human capital. But I want 
to go back, and, and frankly, those two strategies, more women working longer hours and investing in education, those strategies are not available for the next 30 years. We could double the number of people in university, but their employment rate is actually dropping over time. And we don't have another 67% of, of employment rate to add to the current women's uh, uh, participation rates. But more importantly is this idea that we cannot afford an aging population. We had the same dependency ratio when I was a kid, except the dependency, the people that weren't working were kids, and the people that were working spent a fortune on building hospitals, schools, universities for growth. We are now the 11th largest economy in the world. We grew our capacity, human as well as what's in the ground, and that is how we became the 11th largest economy in the world. In fact, a couple of years ago, just before the recession, we were the eighth largest economy. We are falling rapidly because the countries that are gaining are investing in their people. Where is the investment in our people? Can I, can I just ask exactly on this point? It just comes back to a question that I had a little bit earlier. Aren't we talking about an ideological divide here? That there's yeah. a belief on the progressive side that governments uh, have a responsibility to do this type of investment. There's a belief on the conservative side that that is not the proper role for government, that these are, well, you know, take a look at what you're spending on infrastructure. We're, we're facing a huge multi-billion dollar deficit on infrastructure in this country. But is there that type of ideological divide? Because I'm trying to figure out if there's any tendrils between the two sides here of commonality, or is it really just a completely different worldview about the role of government and the role of using public no, money? I don't think it is a different worldview in, a, in many respects. I mean, first of all, all conservatives are spending a lot more than the previous government on infrastructure, no question about it. But uh, you know, the government, uh, conservative governments obviously think there, there's a role for government. They spend a lot of it's $270 billion roughly this year on uh, various programs and services. Uh, I like the idea of limited government, government that understands that there are, there are limits to its competence in, in investing in some areas and, and that the private sector is better at doing some of these things than, than government or bureaucrats in, in some cases or individuals or families. There's no question in my mind that's true. And if, if you don't think it is, that it would make, you know, I would say to somebody like Linda, I would say, you know, do you believe, do you like sending uh, money to the Stephen Harper government uh, or Justin Trudeau government, perhaps, as opposed to keeping it yourself and giving it to the Broadband Institute? No, we got to heave. There you go. Uh, but <laughs> can I just say, you know, what, the, the, the point is that we, okay, if you assume that, uh, like, just look at the fact the way the uh, output has dropped so much because of the oil price decline, okay? So now you have a situation where Canada's, in, you know, all the predictions are we're running into some tough economic times. So what do you do? We've tried relying on the business sector to invest. They haven't invested. And the one bright spot in business investment was in the energy sector. Now that's dried up too. The manufacturing sector isn't picking up the slack. The obvious answer when all these private sector uh, things aren't investing <coughs> is that government must invest. And it's particularly an excellent time to do so because as we've mentioned, Interest rates are at a historic low. There's all these incredible things that need to be done in terms of infrastructure. There's all kinds of slack, the, the, the uh, slack in the labor markets. I mean, there's been a drop in the uh, increase in the uh, unemployment rate. There's been no pickup in private sector investment. There's low interest rates. It's a perfect storm. We need government investment. Can I? Uh I, I want to pick up on infrastructure because I think it's really important. First of all, how many people here come from Toronto? Okay. How long did it take you to get three blocks in Toronto as opposed to driving to Ottawa? Probably about the same. <laughs> Montreal's got the same problem. Vancouver's got the same problem. Has this been an absolute failure of public policy to deal with the infrastructure problem that hurts the bottom line of private companies? because of the workforce being unable to get to their jobs or to find housing within 
uh, a certain area. I mean, to me, this is not a public sector question. This is a private sector question yeah. in terms of the damage that is being done. Do you want to pick it up, Philip? Yeah, yeah, I'd certainly agree with that, but that gets back to the point I was trying to make in my introduction about we have to set priorities. We can't have, I mean, I agree infrastructure is, is needed. It uh, helps job creation and uh, businesses become more competitive. No argument there. But you can't have that plus the daycare plus you know, everything else that's been thrown out here. At some point, you've got to say, okay, we're going to focus on this and that. Yeah. Well, 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 you could actually take some of the money that is being spent on the universal child care benefit, which is not a benefit and does not offer child care. Yeah, the That's billions splitting. of dollars. <laughs> it's, it's just about... It, it is, you could repackage things that are happening now, and infrastructure money is being spent, as Monty said, uh, by the federal government on building prisons, on building bridges, on building ports, on doing everything for trade, because you know what is a hallmark of this government? This, this government loves to say, it's not my job, it's the province's job. When it comes to municipal infrastructure, it's the municipality's job. When it comes to rebuilding the economy, it's the private sector's job. Oh wait, the private sector isn't growing? Oh, it's export's job. Is anybody job but, they're, but theirs and, and frankly they're writing themselves out of a job description while they're bringing themselves deeper and deeper into our lives. It is a diabolical combination. So are, I'm still confused. I'm still confused though. Are you talking about are we going to shift government spending around or are we going to we increase could, it? Well, we're, we're, we're three things. We, we could do three things. We could actually reallocate spending as the Harper government has done, taking existing spending and putting it in their priorities, which do not serve the public interest. We could tax more, or and we could borrow more at a time when there are record low interest rates. And if we do not take advantage of this huge bargain that's out there to fix $173 billion in municipal deficit with the feds at the table driving the best price for taxpayers across across the country on interest rates, we would be idiotic. This would be the most stupid thing, penny wise, pound foolish to say, I'll give you your tax money back instead of actually borrowing at bargain basement prices to make your quality of life better. When somebody says to you, I'm giving your money back, they're saying to you, I don't want to make your quality of life better. Go shopping. <laughs> running a large deficit. So Ontario and Quebec are doing that for you. How's that working out in central Canada? It's called a recession. We got hammered. This is where deficits come from. You turn to the market and you say the market solves everything. The market freaks, freaking messes things up too. <laughs> and, and, I've said and no such thing. Are, governments are I haven't said the word the market all night. <laughs> and and uh, let's go back for a second to the, to the taxes because we have given up so much tax revenue. You know, since 2000, first the Liberals and the Conservatives have given up a total amount of tax revenue that if we had that money today, we'd be collecting an extra $50 billion a year. Yeah. And that $50 billion a year could pay for a huge amount of things. You talk about priorities, we could just line up our priorities, transit, child care, free university it already, education. No, it, but, it already pays for things like groceries, gas for the car, the kids' education. Oh, it already pays and for yet, those things. In, in the year 2000, before this big tax slashing began, we were paying for those things without any problem. We were managing our private lives. In the golden age of capitalism, if you go back to the post-war period from 1945 to 1980, that was the period of highest economic growth and greatest equality. We had much higher taxes proportionally than we have today, and we had much stronger growth and much greater equality. I mean, we can do the, like you've created this situation where we think, you know, if we don't give this money back, people have nothing to live. If you provide <laughs> programs 
that basically support key things in their life, and they don't have to pay $20,000 a year to, send, to put their kid in childcare, they might have a little bit more to, left to live on. Okay. We've, got, uh, we've got just less than 10 minutes left. Uh, so I want to do something here that I think you'll enjoy. Uh, <laughs> Leave. I want to transform you all into Joe Oliver. Oh. So you're sitting there, you're finishing the budget, or maybe just beginning to write the budget. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> what is the single most important thing that Joe Oliver has to do, from your point of view, in this... <laughs> Somebody... Somebody said resign. <laughs> I think that was Jason Kenny. <laughs> so, <laughs> Philip, let me start with you. The single most important that you as Joe Oliver have to do in this budget. I really, uh, I would start putting money aside. I keep coming back to the aging. We don't talk, I was at a session earlier today, believe it or not. And somebody talked about the tyranny of arithmetic, and I can't emphasize enough, the tyranny of the arithmetic of an aging society is uh, colossally negative. We are talking about a, a sharp increase in government spending just because of that. We have to start a, getting ready for that. To do that, do you put the budget in balance, surplus, or deficit? Depends. Either you reform, you get ready by reforming how we deliver health care in particular in this country, or you start setting money aside because if we're going to continue with health care as it currently is, it's going to be a fiscal disaster. Linda. Um, well, there's so many things I don't know where to begin. I, I've already mentioned Single the, most the $36 billion in health care, so I'll talk about something else. And that is the revolting income splitting plan that they're introducing for families. <laughs> They have, and, and having the nerve to call this a family tax cut when it only applies to 15% of the population. And let me just point out, I wouldn't mind if it only benefited 15% of the population, even though it's going to cost $4 billion a year in federal and provincial losses. I wouldn't mind if it only hit only benefited 15% uh, of the population, if it was, let's say, the 15 poorest percent of the population. You know, the, the, the people that really have been truly screwed by the policies of, of the last 20 years. So, so Surplus, deficit, or balance? Uh, I, I, I don't care because, let, let's put it this way, you should always aim for balanced budgets, but not at the expense of sensible programs. And, and you can have balanced budgets by raising taxes as much as you can by cutting spending. This, 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 notion, this notion that balanced budgets you know, is the same as cutting spending, that's a very convenient sleight of hand on the part of the right. The simple truth is a budget can be just as balanced through higher taxes as it can be through spending cuts. Audie? Well, I would, uh, I would be prudent. I would uh, start to, uh, I'd analyze uh, where spending could go that would have a, uh, a better impact. It might be on infrastructure, actually, if I, if I had to. Is it important to you that it be in balance? Yes, it is. Well, first of all, I think it's important to the public. I think the public and the business community who invest here want to see a balanced budget, which is why Canada, Germany, uh, and, uh, and the UK have led you know, growth uh, compared to anybody else because they continue to run balanced budgets and try and be prudent about these things. They actually attract most, investment. Most economists would say that a couple of billion on either side of that line is absolutely no. That's good. right. A couple of billion don't matter, but the trend matters, and uh, okay. I think I think Canada has a good trend. So I would I would keep going in that direction. I would find uh, taxes that inhibit uh, more investment in the country if they're too high. I would trim those, and um, and I would certainly pay down debt if I thought uh, I was concerned about a spike in interest rates that could be coming. I would probably pay down some debt. I mean, okay. So I would start with mission. 
So where do we want to be in 10 years? If I was Joe Oliver, I'd say, I want to make sure Canada is one of the top 10 economies in the next 10 years. That's going to need money coming here, more capital, and it's also going to need, we're going to need to be a people magnet. We're going to need to be a place where people that can go to any country around the world will choose Canada. So how do we make Canada the number one place for money and people to come to in the next 10 years so we don't slide out of that top 10? And when I have that plan, which would be a 10 year infrastructure plan and infrastructure in the sense of laying the foundation for the next period of growth, dealing with the $173 billion of deficit at the municipal infrastructure level, dealing with the lack of childcare for people that are working, dealing with the fact that we're going to need all hands on deck and everybody that can get educated, get educated. These three principles in a 10 year plan, I would borrow for the hard stuff, I would tax for the other stuff, and I would say if balanced budgets are your number one concern, Canadians pay for the world you want. This is what I would give you. How, how deeply in debt would you go in this budget? Oh, I, I, I actually, I would have to do the math, and I don't have it off the top of my head, on what it would cost to go into debt. You mean deficit, 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 deficit. right? That depends on interest payments, and you could lock down 10-year loans right now at bargain basement prices. You might add a, a ton, like a couple of billion dollars in debt charges, depending on how long the bonds are that you're buying. So I don't know. I'd have to sit down with the math. This isn't a big problem. The bigger problem would be how much do you think you can tax Canadians right now? How much will they accept if they think they're getting a bargain? Because the federal government services and its support of the provinces to make every community better is the biggest bargain you're going to get in your wallet ever. Okay. I promised Linda at the beginning of this that I would return to her the time that she demanded <laughs> and that I so grievously mis, uh, misheld from her. So what I'd like to do, just in the, in, in the few minutes that we've got left, if all of you could just sort of try and crystallize within two minutes your final <clears throat> best shot at winning over this audience. <laughs> yes, yes, Monty, I'm looking at you. Yeah. We're going to do. We're going to go team reality and and team. I don't know. Yeah. How to call yourselves. Yeah. Hey. On the girls' club. The girls', the girls okay. club. <laughs> you get to call yourselves. Uh, so we're going to start off. Uh, Philip, if you want to give us your best uh, shots. One thing that hasn't been mentioned, you, you, people keep talking about government programs and it's if, you know, all this money goes out and the benefits go directly to average Canadians and everybody thinks that's wonderful. Coming from the civil service, you haven't noted one thing. The civil service has become extremely good at latching on to money and keeping it itself. Uh, something like of the, uh, of the increase in sp health care spending that the Romanov report advocated, the Martin budget brought in huge increases in health care spending. The bureaucracy kept 80% of it. Uh, now that might be an extreme example, but the average civil servant in the federal government now costs $100,000. Uh, so remember, in all these government programs you're designing, they're going to be administered by bureaucrats, and they're very good at, at latching on to dollars, and they don't make it to services, and that's why government has a bad name with a lot of Canadians. Linda. Oh, well, can I just pick up where I was? Uh <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, my, my, what I was trying to show was that if we look at Alberta, okay, you know, and we see that they've used their conservative austerity type agenda mentality to deal with oil and as a result have squandered this fabulous resource, you know, keeping uh, taxes low by living off oil, etc., and, and, and only having 17 billion in in revenue to show for all that, and I want to juxtapose that against Norway, Norway that is quintessentially, you know, the welfare state. I mean, you've got high taxes, high spending, government investment, government ownership, all that stuff, which I summarized as being the whole crackpot agenda, or I could have gone on to say it's kind of the full Monty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've heard that. But, but, 
because of their their sort of you know social their, their progressive economic thinking applied to an oil resource that's virtually identical to the one in Alberta, they have dramatically different results. I mean, for one thing, they've started from the from the conception that government will play a key role in managing and investing the oil and the results of the oil and, and saving it and making sure that it's economically beneficial for all Norwegians. So as a result of that, when the oil prices declined recently, you know, panic in Alberta, no panic in Norway, no big deal at all in Norway, in fact. And you know why that is? Because of their progressive economic thinking, they, are, they own a, a full publicly owned oil company. They own their own oil company worth billions of dollars. And on top of that, they've saved for the rainy day, just like Alberta saved 17 billion, except Norway saved one trillion. Okay. So, so, so I, just to conclude, Philip may call that crackpot economics. I call it jackpot economics. <laughs> Two minutes, go. Well, first of all, you don't want to see the full Monty, I can tell you. <laughs> um, just with respect to uh, Alberta, Linda mentioned this, you know, between 2000 and 2010, 95% uh, of all the revenue increases in Alberta went to the Alberta Public Service. According to the School of Public Policy, a report published in, uh, by... Uh, by uh, uh, Ken Bosenkool. There's a name that some people may, may remember. <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, it's absolutely true that uh, there's no question what Philip said is, is to, to some degree the case. That's happened in Alberta. It's one of the reasons why we continue to run deficits even though we've had record revenues. With respect to Norway, as I pointed out, according to the New York Times, uh, you know they've had some great. They've had some great success. They've had some great success. They've had some great success. But it's I, well. I, please come up here. Let's debate. And according Ben's according to Norway the report, on the list. I, I pulled up the report from the New York Times. They listed Norway. They listed the Netherlands. Let him do it. Come on, guys. And uh, according to that uh, story, uh, Norway and the Netherlands, Canada was beating them all in terms of uh, revenue, in income growth for the middle class. Uh, so we can debate that a little later. But anyway, uh, so I'm, uh, although I, uh, I'm of Norwegian descent, and I'm very proud of uh, my Norwegian uh, ancestors, uh, you know, there are some differences there that we should, we should take note of. I guess I would finally say that, you know, Canada is doing extraordinarily well. I know people say, well, you know, Canada, we could be doing so much more, but we weathered the recession better than almost any yeah. country in the world. Lord. We're producing all kinds of jobs compared to most of the rest of the world. This is still a place where people that choose to come to from around the world. Canada's pretty good uh, the way it is right now. As a Norwegian, do you get a piece of the action on the oil? <laughs> no, I, uh, okay, I, no, I don't. Right. Okay, last two minutes to you, Armin. Okay, so I would say to all of you in this room, start with where you want to head. Start with where you want to go. Don't look at the bottom line. Look at the horizon line. Get to a place that is sustainable, that is inclusive, that keeps Canada in the top 10 economies and societies of the world. Let's be the best country in the world. To do that, we're gonna to have to spend more. To spend more, we're gonna actually have to pay some more. We're gonna let the market deliver the goods and we're gonna let our governments deliver the good. That's the way we're gonna grow. Thank you. You've all been very patient and uh, really enjoyed the engagement of everybody in this room in this discussion, but we now are wrapping up and we get to the point that Philip and Monty have been waiting for all afternoon. By your applause, I want to find out <laughs> the applause who won right. this debate. <laughs> for 
Team Reality. Oh. <laughs> they didn't win the bit. They didn't. And for the people without ties? <laughs> I think we'll call it a draw. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, on your behalf, I'd like to thank Monty, Philip, Linda, and Amit. Thank you.